What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Eddie Liger Power Hour, this time featuring Professor Garrido. I'm happy to have Carlos with us today to break down some of these topics. Uh, one of the main things we're going to be talking about is Peter Zihon, who's one of these geopolitical um, strategists or geopolitical analysts um, who kind of emerged from some corporate think tanks. Uh, so he was on Joe Rogan recently predicting that China was going to collapse within the next 10 years. So we'll talk about that prediction and Zihon's history of making predictions similar to that. Um, we'll also talk about some some big tweets like Joe Biden saying that on, on his watch, healthcare will always be protected or healthcare will always remain a right, um, which is laughable. I don't even know why he would tweet that. Um, he knows how ridiculous of a thing to say that is. Um, we'll talk about Tucker Carlson recently saying that the um, the head of the Capitol Police told him that the January 6th riots were flooded with, you know, FBI agents and um, police officers and different different parts of the armed bodies of the state. So should be a good show today. Got a lot to talk about. We'll jump right into it after the intro. <laughs> First, I want to say, do as our buddy Louis Logic says and like the stream to push us in the Al Gore rhythm. Um, <laughs> that Al Gore rhythm is very manipulated um, to push content like ours down and boost content by the kind of people we're going to be talking about today with this Peter Zihon fella. So, yeah. Um, first of all, Carlos, I want to ask, how are you doing? And then um, do you know anything about this Peter Zihon guy? Um, before we jump into his history. I'm doing good. I am happy to announce that I uh, finished the content of, of my third upcoming book on Hegel, Marxism, and the dialectic. Um, should be coming out sometime by the uh, before the end of the year, or maybe early next year, um, content-wise is done. We do have a bunch of publications um, in line before that, so uh, happy about that. And uh, in terms of uh, Peter Zihon, I, I think I've seen some of his uh, Rogan clips before just uh, surface uh, on the Internet. Um, I don't know much about him himself, though. So, uh, how, But uh, how are you doing today? Good, good. I'm excited. I had a lot of energy um, today. I, was, I recently read Domenico Lacerdo's uh, Defense of Chinese Socialism, and it got me pumped up. Um, this is about learning and reading and... Um, uh what china is doing to advance the science of marxism but then i came across the zihan guy and um, <laughs> i figured in addition to talking about um uh, lacerdo's book which is one of the other topics we want to cover today it'd be fun to break this guy down um if you know this is a funny comment the white gordon chang if you know who gordon chang is that's basically who peter zihan is he pushes the same kind of narrative constantly claiming that china is going to collapse um, in 2001, Gordon Chang wrote a book called The Coming Collapse of China, saying the Chinese miracle is over. You know, China is destined to just fall apart politically, economically, um, in every way. Didn't happen, obviously. China's continued their growth. They're now the second largest economy on Earth, and they've uh, accomplished the incredible feat of actually abolishing relative poverty. 
But what do you know? Political analyst Gordon Chang is still going on Fox News and saying, you know, post pandemic, China's economy is in a dire situation. So for 20, and this is published in uh, just two days ago in 2023. So for the last 23 years, this dude's been predicting the collapse of China <laughs> as China has continued to grow, um, grow and advance technologically. Um, and as none of these guys predictions come true they're continued or they're continually given um spots on fox news uh, you know hosted by corporate media who ask them about their analysis of china when these people should be discredited because their predictions have have proven false time and time again and uh it's you know not only has it not collapsed but it's been on a steady upward turn a steady growth and that includes the periods where the whole global capitalist economy went into crisis. In 2008, China was one of the few places that continued growing and uh, where their people weren't affected, as it were, in the U.S., where you know many middle class families lost their, their status and it accelerated the process that we've been calling at the Institute following the lead of Noah Krashevich, reproletarianization. And then with uh, recent uh, crisis that came about with the COVID pandemic, China was one of the few places in the world where not only was it able to uh, put people's lives first, but it still was able to sustain growth, whereas the West was trying to figure out how do we keep profits instead of ensure the safety of people's lives. And not only did it lose a whole ton of more lives than China did, but it also failed to grow. It, it actually, the economy shrunk in that period. So it's been, you know, you can't look at China and then look at the Western imperialist powers over the last two decades and say that socialism fails every time or something or that socialism is a worse economic system than capitalism because it's proven in every instance that it is uh incredibly superior by every single metric you can look at the video just started playing there ahead of time but yeah um i couldn't agree more and we can go into detail about that as we break this down we're going to take a look at today zihan's um appearance on the Joe Rogan experience. This is what Peter Zihan looks like for the the uninitiated, those who don't know. But um, before that, I just want to tell you a little bit about this guy's history. Um, so Zihan predicted in 2005 and 2010 that China was going to collapse within the next 10 years. So similar to Gordon Chang, he's been making this claim that China's destined for collapse um, for the last 15 years. And he's still making that claim. You know, he's still out here brashly confidently predicting the collapse of China, uh, despite being so horrendously in, and obviously wrong um, repeatedly in the past. Uh, that article, or in, in a 2010 article published in Business Insider, Zihan said, by the end of the decade, it will be pretty obvious to everyone that the China miracle is over. Well, you know, after the next 10 years, China has only increased their economy. They've only shown to be more of an industrial superpower. And as we said earlier, they've accomplished the feats of abolishing relative poverty and becoming the second most powerful economy in the world after only 70 years ago being an agricultural, um, feudal, very, very, uh, quote unquote, backwards economy. Um, in 2005, when uh, Zihan was working for this sort of think tank type organization called Stratfor that I'll talk more about in a second, he said China will suffer a meltdown like Japan, and as well as East and Southeast Asia before it. The staggering proportion of bad debt, enormous even in relation to official dollar reserves, represents a defining crisis for China. Um, which, of course, not only has been has proven wrong because China hasn't collapsed because of their debt, but they were one of the reasons that the Western economies were even able to survive the 2008 financial crisis in China. You know, three years after. Um, Zihan predicted their collapse um, due to their their failing economy. They were the only economy in the entire world to continue growing during the 2008 financial crisis. So the opposite of what Zihan uh, predicted was going to happen is what actually happened. So a little bit about Zihan's history that'll help you understand better where he's coming from, where his perspective is, um, and where the money that backs him is coming from. Um, he spent 12 years working for Stratfor, which is an American intelligence publishing company um, who perform intelligence gathering and advisory services centering on geopolitics for wonderful companies like Lockheed Martin, Goldman Sachs, 
Bank of America, Coca-Cola, Dow Chemical Company. Um, so these are the kind of people that that Zihan was advising. And he eventually became the vice president um, of Stratfor, this intelligence gathering company. Um, some leaked emails in 2011 showed that Stratfor was getting information directly from the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. So they're basically a, a private CIA cutout similar to the NED, but maybe on a much smaller scale. Um, Barron's weekly paper or Barron's, which is a weekly paper, once called them the shadow CIA. Um, and they raised millions and millions of dollars through private investors. They just constantly have money pumped into them. So since then, Zihan has left Stratfor um, and he started his own sort of consulting and intelligence gathering company. So um, I'm not sure where his claims, his predictions about China are coming from. I think I think it might just be a grift. I think he might just be saying things that are shocking because he knows how many views he can get on YouTube. There are a lot of YouTubers who are doing this now, like um, putting these really um, clickbaity titles about the, the coming collapse of China and how China's economy is imploding. So it could just be a grift um, or and, and you'll see this more as we get into the video. Or he's trying to convince companies to stop investing in China because there's still so many companies who are investing capital in China because they're making money off of it. Um, and Zihan is trying to discourage them from doing that and trying to encourage capital flight from China um, as a way to weaken their economy. Um, and that'll um, I can get more into that argument as we go here. But yeah, anything to say before we start the video, Carlos? I mean, maybe I could save this analysis until after the video, but um, I think you've done a good job at presenting the background that shows the material interests that are driving his ideological positions. And it's fair to say that, you know, perhaps all of this is being pulled out of, uh, you know, the place where the sun doesn't hit him. Um, but uh, even if even if it's not, I think it's telling of the mode of analysis, because maybe he's just saying, well, if everything continues the way that it is and then everything stays uh, in China static, um, this is going to happen in 10 years. And that uh, is archetypical of the bourgeois outlook of the way that, you know, bourgeois thinkers approach the world, where they think that everything is the way that it is and that uh, transformations don't occur. And what happens when you have a country that's led by a communist party that's conscious of its historical role is that even if it sees a crisis coming, it's able to avert it because its interests are not dictated by the market and capitalist profits, but by the interests of the people. And so even if you can get to such a position where it could be predicted that if China continues going the way that it's going in 10 years, it's going to crash, the Communist Party would never allow that to happen. And it's shown historically that it won't. Again, the case of 2008 and the global financial crisis and also the case of um, the, the COVID pandemic, like every prediction that they made was, oh, China's going to crash. And then China is able to you know, maneuver and do things necessary so that its people don't end up getting hit hard, even if it cuts into profits and the interests of the markets. That's something that the West cannot do or doesn't uh, allow itself to do because capital is in command. And that's what you're gonna see. I mean, what his argument fits exactly with what you predicted there. He's gonna show snapshots of China's population and try to imply that that shows inevitable collapse. And, you know, you even hear Joe Rogan, I've heard him say this since then, you know, how crazy is it that China didn't see these demographic problems happening? How crazy is that that they didn't predict this? It's like, it is crazy because they did predict it. China's very aware of their changing demographics and their population. And, you know, they'll they'll adjust their economy. Um, so, uh, yeah, we can get into it right now then. <laughs> the Joe Rogan experience. The rich world was a population column from 1945 to 1992. And with the end of the Cold War, the developing world became a column in 1992 until now. The problem is that this is all temporary because birth rate keeps dropping, people keep living older, and your column eventually inverts into an open pyramid upside down. And now you no longer have children. You no longer have a replacement generation at all. And there aren't enough people in their 20s and 30s to buy everything. And there aren't enough people in their 40s and 50s to pay for the retirees. So this decade was always going to be the decade that most of the advanced world moves into mass retirement and the economic model collapses. There are, you know, demographic issues, and we're seeing this in, you know, a lot of different countries. But I also think this is just another form of Malthusianism. He's drawing a connection between 
industry and, and commerce with population size or with demographics without ever actually showing a proof of correlation, you know, without ever showing that size of population is materially correlated to how much exchange or how much production is going on in this economy. Um, so it's a different form of Malthusianism than, you know, Robert Thomas Malthus in the 1800s saying that the famine in India um, was caused by the growth of their population. But it's it's a similar type of thing where you try and connect uh, the population of a, of a um, country to their economy. And he'll never actually draw a material correlation. He'll never actually show how, you know, the, the changing population affects the economy. Um, but he'll use that, you know. Um, he'll try and state that there is a correlation there. And it sounds really good for a lot of people because you hear the words population and you're like, wow, that's a concrete analysis. They're talking about the whole, all the people, et cetera. And that's something that uh, Marx debunks in his process of working out his critique of capitalist political economy at the beginning of the Grand Dries, where he says that these analyses that start with population and try to make these connections are all based on false concreteness. They don't actually have the concrete, what they have is in what he called an imagined concrete. Uh, and ultimately, it's really just an idealist projection onto the world that's not grounded on an actual concrete analysis of the conditions in China. Exactly. Someone says, so are all of his stories just fake? Some of his data points are, are off and questionable and have been critiqued. But a lot of times what he's doing is what Carlos said, taking a data point, taking a snapshot in isolation you know, and trying to draw the conclusion from that, that it means um, inevitable collapse. Um, and here, what I, we're trying to point out is that he's tying um, population to how the economy is doing and demographic numbers to how the economy is doing when those things aren't necessarily correlated and he'll never prove that they're correlated. And next decade was always going to be the decade that that happened to the developing world. And we find out recently that the Chinese have jumped the ship, and this is their last decade too. So all of the globalized connections and consumptions that create the world we know, we are at the end of it. And we have So it's also a cope for the American economy that's deindustrializing and declining. Oh, it's not because of capitalism and outsourcing and financialization. It's all because of changing demographics, you know, and, and next it'll happen to China. Spoiler alert, in 10 years, all everything he said will be, seem ridiculous because it's not going to happen unless there's some kind of external regime change in China. And I don't know if uh, Zaihan is critical of like the, 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 the state of things in the West, but um, that seems to be a constant go to for people that even want to be critical about the establishment, because I just saw a video of uh, Tucker Carlson recently where in order to compare the very visible cognitive decline of Joe Biden and how the media just ignores it. He references like uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea um, and how when, you know, one of the Kims, I can't remember which one, got a big tumor on the back of his neck, the media all ignored it. It's like, well, that's not true. <laughs> that's not even uh, remotely true. But it's interesting how always in order to critique the established order of the West, and unfortunately, you know, Jimmy Dore is someone who does this as well with the case of censorship. They always then have to reference the boogeyman of communism. And then their reference point for how bad capitalist imperialism is getting is always some uh, caricature, uh, projection and, and false image of what communism supposedly is, did or does. So true. Um, and I see the virtual Jonathan catching on already. He's trying to make a self fulfilling prophecy, create a scare. So there's less investment. It's transparent. I agree. Um, I think he, I think partially he's a grifter and he's trying to say things that have shock value and that will pick up traction for him on the internet. But I also think, and this is based on his position as a corporate consultant and intelligence gatherer and geopolitical analyst who anal or, you know, informs corporations and consults corporations. I think he's trying to encourage capital flight from China in order to weaken the Chinese economy. And like you said, this self-fulfilling prophecy um, of China collapsing will finally come true for him, um, which isn't going to happen because China's an $18 trillion economy and the second largest economy in the world. And corporations aren't just going to leave because the central intelligence agency is telling them to because um, they dislike China's politics. But 
have to go back to a world where trade is more focused on the countries that have a better demographic and security infrastructure because the Americans are no longer patrolling the global oceans anymore. So we're losing the security. America's no longer patrolling the global oceans. We're losing our security. Let's put more military in the South China Sea, right? That's a good idea, right? Look how big, bad, and evil China is. Their economy keeps growing. We need a larger military presence in their uh, waters. And this is the problem with the uh, Sophism and, and this form of uh, uh, rhetorical uh, approaches where your arguments could be completely substanceless, like not grounded in facts, not grounded in logical deductions and rational deductions. But if the way that you express them uh, sounds eloquent, the vast majority of people uh, will sit there and be like, damn, that makes sense. And what's sad is that you can get someone arguing the completely a completely different thing on Joe Rogan's podcast and Joe Rogan would be like, oh, damn, that makes sense. But then you bring, you know, this uh, um, the sophist on. And because of those devices and the form through which he speaks, he'll end up convincing Joe. And I'm sure Joe's a few times in this podcast, even though I haven't seen it. Um, I've only seen bits of it. He'll be like, oh, wow, that makes sense. Or he'll engage with uh, uh, these substanceless arguments. Yep. <laughs> he provides very little pushback he has some good questions but mostly just like wow yeesh ramifications of an open system at the same time we're losing the demographic capacity to support it in the first place and that's all going down right now so when you're, when you're saying that china has 10 years to go at what, most what do you mean by that well and you can tell joe sees how ridiculous this is at points too which is funny well, we now know that they've lied about their population statistics and they're, they overcounted their population by over 100 million people, all of whom would have been born since the one child policy was adopted. So this is one of those places where they've got more people in their 60s and their 50s and their 40s and their 30s and their 20s. Now, what was the logic behind the one child? Was it that they were overpopulating? Mao was concerned that as the country was modernizing, the birth rate wasn't dropping fast enough and that the young generation was literally going to eat the country alive. So they went through... This is unrelated, but I heard recently that the one-child policy might have been pushed on China by the West. Do you know anything about that, Carlos? I do not. Um, no. My guess would be that the, the forces of production hadn't developed to a point where they could have allowed just massive population growth. and have, That's always been my understanding. but Right. And that would, you know, if that is the case, and, you know, maybe it's not, um, but that would imply that uh, with the development that China has had and the immense opportunities that young people have in China, that all the incentives would be there for uh, for the population to develop and for young people to have kids in ways in which they're just not in the U.S. Like, you know, I'm kind of I'm told a few times that I'm crazy for for having a kid at, at my age in, in the U.S. because there's literally, you know, barely any opportunities. But in China is a complete opposite. So, I mean, from that standpoint, that assumes that the practices of generations past in terms of um, birth rates and, uh, and, and, you know, it assumes that it's going to continue the same. And it misses the point that life in China changes sometimes by the year. Like you go to one province and you revisit it five years after, and it's a completely different province, right? In ways in which we just don't understand in the West. And um, I have friends over there and I've, I've followed many people who vlog over there and uh, they'll return to a place that they visited two years ago. And it's like, it's like, if it's not the same place and crazy changes, Gen Zen, dude, Daniel Dumbrell, every, every week, there's something new. Exactly. And so these changes reflect themselves in the individuals and in the choices that, um, in the elements that, uh, constitute, um, important factors in making the choice of whether they want to have a kid or not. And, their choice usually is going to end up leading them to understanding that if they have a kid, they're going to have tremendous opportunities as parents and, and for their kids in a country that's developing and, and, and flourishing as opposed to what we're doing in the U.S. It's the complete opposite. Yep. Breakneck urbanization program, which destroyed the birth rate. At the same time, they penalized anyone who wanted to have kids. And both of those at the same time have generated the demographic collapse we're in now. And the problem with that also was that they wanted male. Notice how he never describes what the demographic collapse is or how it will affect China's um, pro uh, process of industrialization or whatever. It's just 
what some people have called macroeconomic hand waving, right? Saying demographic collapse, right? That sounds nice. It sounds intelligent, but he never says what he means by that. Children. Yeah, there's a cultural aspect to that too. And obviously men can't have kids on their own. And what is the like ratio to men to women and the younger people in China? Can you pause that real quick? Because what's, what's implicit in that is like, uh, the Asiatic uh, um, patriarchalism and, and anti-woman sexist sentiments. And that is bullshit. That is destroyed as soon as the communists, not fully destroyed, it still has to be combated, but it's institutionally destroyed as soon as the communists grab power. And the people that wanted to uh, propel those similar patriarchal and, and sexist forms of life are the people that these folks endorse. Um, the, you know, the, what's that dance that's been going around that, the uh, theatrical, um, Oh, the theater, Shen Yu, is that what it's called? I, I don't remember what it's called, but all of those interests that are anti, uh, China and anti, uh, the people's Republic that represent the old order where there was sexism and where there was a, a strong patriarchy that all gets removed with not fully, but it's, it's combated at the state level institutionally with the communists, you know, it's, and that's across the board. The same thing happens in the Soviet Union and Cuba and in every socialist country, because whereas capitalism cannot survive without racism, without sexism, socialism cannot survive with it. It has to continuously fight against these poisoned uh, forms of false consciousness, which sever the people from each other, which divide the people instead of uniting them. I'm sure. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into the Lacerdo piece later. Before the data revision with the last set of lies, it was about 1 to 1.2. It was the most distorted in the world, even more than Sri Lanka, where there had been a civil war for 30 years. Uh, since then, we don't have good sex by sex data, but it's undoubtedly worse. And so what are the other problems that they're encountering that leads you to believe that they only have 10 years left? Well, without young people, we've seen their labor costs increase by a factor of 14 since the year 2000. So labor costs have been increased. Labor costs from the perspective of the bourgeoisie, from the perspective of multinational capitalists, who this guy is an analyst on, on behalf of labor costs. What is another word for labor costs? wages oh no so chinese wages have increased 14 times no clearly their society is collapsing right and uh that's what that's the you know marx makes this point in the i believe is the second german edition to the first volume of capital where he's like because of the class interests of the bourgeoisie their ideologues just cannot understand the world anymore and, uh, you know, at, maybe at one point when the bourgeoisie was still a somewhat revolutionary class, you can have your Smiths and your Ricardos that can they they can attempt as uh, to the best of their ability to reproduce the concrete concretely. That means to actually have a, a, a view in their thought of the existing order that corresponds to the reality. They can't do that anymore. There's so many biases entrenched to the fact that they attach their interest to the existing order that prevents them from understanding the world uh, as it actually is. And that's what he's doing here. You know, Occam's razors would say, oh, 14 times uh, uh, the a 14 time increase of the labor costs. You know, what what could that be? Wage increases. The fact that Chinese Chinese living standards are just rocketing upwards. No, it can't be that. It has to be all these different factors. And OK, my conclusion is going to be that the population is getting older. And so older people need more things and more costs. And that's like it's BS, but it's what they have to do in order to have whatever semblance of empirical analysis that they're making match up to the predisposed conclusions that they need the empirical uh, data to, uh, to imply. Right. When you hear him talk about the empirical data, he's not even, he's not even close to exact, right? His only thing is that China's lying about the numbers and, you know, the demographic demographics have surely gotten worse. That's all he gives us. Um, so he doesn't even have precise data points or concrete data points that you would use in, say, a dialectical materialist analysis of China, like we're going to show later in the show with Domenico Lacerdo. Um, but, yeah, that's what they have to do is just extrapolate from from data or smudged data to, to try and draw these broad conclusions um, about the inevitable collapse of the U.S.'s enemies.
Mexican labor is now one third the cost of Chinese labor. Their educational system focuses on memorization over skills. So despite a trillion. So that is just absurdly wrong, scary wrong. And if you want to know how wrong that is, I listened to this podcast with this apolitical, completely apolitical guy, Jeffrey Townsend, or Towson, who uh, is involved in the technology sector and um, is a professor in China. And he says, you know, straight up, like if you take 100 college students from China and then 100 from the U.S., the, the Chinese college students are going to run circles around them um, every single time. And not only that, but their um, Zihan says they're based on memorizational learning rather than skill development. That is so far from the truth. In Chinese elementary schools and middle schools, they're already exposing the kids to industrial work you know, having them do like what we would call tech ed classes here in the U.S., heavily focused on skill development, um, very different from the U.S. education system, which is based on the factory school system, um, basically just training up kids to be good factory workers. But um, China focuses on heavily or heavily on skill development at all stages of education. But, you know, um, higher education specifically, they're making huge breakthroughs um, in technology and and many different fields so and that's a really weird dichotomy because it juxtaposes skill uh implied in tech in a technical sense to memorization which is like a form of learning that if you absolutize it that's where you have problems but in the u.s memorization is absolutized like learning consists of remembering as much stuff as you can for the exam and that's not to say that this process of of, of mem memorizing things isn't important or plays some elementary role in, in learning. Um, there's that uh, famous Latin uh, proverb of sorts, repetitio est mater studiorium, which is repetition is the mother of all knowledge. Yeah, to a certain uh, base extent it, it it is. But in China, you have a mixture of everything. It's one of the only countries in the world where the humanities are booming. The humanities are not really based on just memorizing like what Plato said or something or you know, with uh, Hemingway said, it's 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 somewhat creative and open. And, you know, it's not just in the tech where China has completely boomed and most of the developments that are coming from tech are in the world are coming from China, but it's also in the humanities in every field of learning. And um, that's just what you get when you get socialism. You get to emphasize education in a way that's not just to produce robots that can then enter the workforce and be smart enough to do the jobs that they need, but dumb enough to not think critically about why it is that they are doing those jobs and why it is that the existing state of affairs is the way that it is. For sure. Million dollars of investment in a bottomless supply of intellectual property theft. They really haven't advanced technologically in the last 15 years. China hasn't advanced technologically in the last 15 years, he says. Again, if you don't want to trust us, if you think we're biased because we're Marxists, listen to this podcast where Jeffrey Towson talks about China leading the world in, in technological advancements because they absolutely are. I mean, this is pure nonsense, and he's just reliant here on his audience being completely uneducated um, about what's going on in China. I mean, Carlos just said they're leading the world in technological innovations. They're leading the world in all these fields. Um, so to say that they're collapsing because there's no technological innovation and because of intellectual property theft is hilarious um, when uh, the use um, of intellectual property laws to gain a competitive advantage um, is rampant in the West and it's uh, often slows down technological advancement in the West because corporations will use intellectual property laws to prevent competitors from developing um, cheaper, newer, better products. Um, and it puts a, a big fetter on technological advancement and productive advancement in the U.S. So it's, it's pure projection. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, development is based on the bottom line in, in, in the capitalist West, and that's profit. If you could do something that will benefit a whole bunch of people or just boost technological development, but if it's not very profitable, you don't consider it as one of your options. Profit is the the bottom line, the, the first and, and only consideration in all of these um, in, in all of these areas. But you make a really good point that like he's banking on the fact that his audience or the people listening are ignorant uh, of this. And obviously, if it's primarily working people uh, who are listening, 
in what time are they supposed to like look up the reality of, of China and, and listen to, you know, 30 different speeches and podcasts and read books and a bunch of articles? Like, that's not very likely. I mean, there's some people like Noah Krashevich who, you know, wakes up, uh, one of the directors at our institute wakes up at five o'clock, four o'clock in the morning to do that, comes home from work, does it and continues to do it. But that's not the vast majority of people. And they're banking on the fact that there's a, a one dimensional voice, uh, whether it's in a big corporate uh, mainstream media or the big podcast that, you know, there's some divergences in some important areas, but whenever the subject of a communist state comes along, there is a complete uh, unidimensional understanding of, of, of communism, of China, of Cuba, of the former USSR, and no alternative voices in those areas are ever allowed to enter the discourse. Never. And so, um, you know, how do you, how do you fact check that? Like, it's kind of easy for us that we've been doing this for a very long time, but for people that are not used to like doing research, how do you even go about like the, the, the process of thinking how you can even fact check that against like contrary claims and contrary evidence that if they see it, it's going to obviously be rooted in, in, in facts and, 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 you know, not in a house of cards, like his arguments are, but how do you go about that process? So it's, it's banking on an ignorance of the people that they, love sustaining yes uh mexican labor is probably about twice as skilled as chinese labor now even though it's one-third the cost uh they've consolidated into an ethnic based paranoid nationalistic cult of personality and it's very difficult for the xi administration to even run it because it's not an administration anymore no one wants to bring xi information on it so how funny is that china is a total cult of personality dominated by xi jinping but Nobody wants to bring Xi Jinping information anymore because he's such an evil dictator. Well, which one is it, Peter? Which one is it? Do the people bow down and worship Xi Jinping every day because uh, of his cult of personality? Or are they all terrified of Xi Jinping and they won't bring um, Xi Jinping any information? And by a paranoid nationalistic um, people, he means a people who are aware of imperialist aggression a people who are patriotic and a people who are dedicated to defending themselves from external attacks. And from the perspective of Peter, a Western imperialist, you know, he hates that. He can't stand that the Chinese people are committed to maintaining their sovereignty, maintaining their independence, and that they're aware of um, this sort of imperialist, prog uh, imperialist aggression and imperialist tactics that are um, bound to be used against them. So he calls them um, a nationalistic cult of personality or whatever. Um, but that's just him, again, coping because the Chinese people are aware of what him and his cronies are trying to do in, in overthrowing their country. And banking on these myths that have been created relatively recently as of the last two decades that like uh, China is like an ethno state, that it's uh, mistreats its minorities and that's uh, um, that's overseeing the process of a Uyghur genocide or cultural genocide. Um, and that's just completely false. And when you compare it to the U.S., it's just um, in incredible, the, the hypocrisy. But I, I recently saw this video from uh, Li Jingjing. If you don't know of her channel, please go check it out. It's uh, phenomenal. Um, but uh, he talks, uh, she has an expert on who talks about like how you have different currencies uh, d different languages within the currency, which is something that like we don't have in the U.S., even though we have like uh, uh, the portion of the population that doesn't speak uh, uh, that that speaks other languages from English is a lot larger than what it is in China. So the near from China, Chinese currency. But if you look at the here in the script, you have both. Chinese, English, and Arabic characters, which is the language of the Uyghurs. And China put it on its national currency. This never happened in Europe or the United States. To have not the national language, but a minority language on your national currency. And I have a certain... <laughs> yes, that, that shows the Han nationalism of the Chinese government. Um, 
<laughs> and I mean, there's so many examples like that. Like Uyghur people were exempted from the one child policy for cultural and religious reasons. Um, they've been given their own autonomous zone to practice their culture. So it's the Definitely most mosque. Been... Sorry, go ahead. It, it's the most mosque dense area. Um, I, I think in the whole world or in the whole like non Arab uh, part of the world anything so like putin lied to his face for example the last last february about the wars and you know, why would i invade ukraine and you can see in some of the the presses the, the defense guys in the back of the room like they didn't want to say anything because she has a history of shooting people he doesn't like uh and so they the, the chinese were the only country that was caught with a it's like he's a cartoon villain like a mob boss it's like he expects americans to think that action movies are how the world really works if anyone disobeys Xi, just grabs a pistol and like shoots them in the head or pulls a lever and they fall into like a, a vat of crocodiles. You know, if you disobey the regime. Well, that's why the movies are there and that's why the shows are there and that's why the media is there and it's all interconnected. Like they can only bank on like people believing this because there's a whole background of cultural apparatuses that have conditioned people to believe this. Without that background that gets institutional financial support and that's, you know, it's gets billions and billions and billions of dollars pumped into it in order to make people believe these things. Without that background, no one would have the confidence to go on a show like that and say such stupid things. Mm -hmm. Pants down when this all went down. Uh, the Biden administration is basically taking the trade policy of Donald Trump and running it through a grammar checker and putting it into institutions. So we now have tech barricades that prevent the Chinese from buying the equipment, the tools, or the software that's necessary to make semiconductors. In fact, he went so far as to say any Americans working in the sector have to either quit or give up their American citizenship. Every single one of them either quit or was transferred abroad within 24 hours. So the tech system is stalled. They don't have the young people to go consumption-led. They're completely dependent on the U.S. Navy to access international trade. They are the most vulnerable country in the world right now. And based on how things go with Russia, we're looking at a significant amount of raw materials falling off the map, specifically food and energy. And the Chinese are the world's largest importer of both of those things. So there, there's no version of this where China comes through looking good. And the challenge for... Basically just a threat to sanction China when he says they're dependent on the U.S. Navy. Um, and when he says they're semiconductor, you know, they're not able to produce semiconductors. Taiwan's the biggest semiconductor producer in the world by a lot. Um, and, you know, Taiwan is a part of China, but of course not in this guy's worldview. In this guy's worldview, Taiwan is independent and, you know, they'll allow themselves to be used as a puppet of the U.S. and, you know, cut cut China off from semiconductors, which, of course, Taiwan has said they're not going to do. Um, and in, in response, recently, a few U.S. politicians have floated the idea of, of destroying um, what it, TC, whatever the name of the semiconductor facility is in Taiwan, um, which is just an insane, um, aggressive threat uh, towards a country for producing semiconductors and not doing what what we want. But and quarter here gets the the irony right they're completely dependent on a foreign military that's trying to encircle them from accessing the oceans like what and, and for real to say that they're dependent on the one force that prevents them from doing things that would allow them to thrive a little more it's just so completely upside down that again like how someone has the confidence to go on a show where he's going to be seen by millions and say such stupid and baseless things is it's again banking on the the fact that uh, people are ignorant about these about these issues. TCMC, thank you, um, Timmy Smith. For the rest of us, is to figure out how do we, in as smooth and quick as a process as possible, figure out how we can get along without them because they are going away, and they're going away this decade for certain. Well, if you say they're going away, just as I predicted in twenty ten. <laughs> Clearly, they're not just going to lay down. They're no, they're going to try to adjust. You could tell Joe Rogan realizes how stupid this shit is. Clearly, they're not just going to lay down. They're just 1.2 billion people are going to go away. Yes. Yes, Joe. Don't you? Can't you tell? I'm saying it confidently. I'm saying it in an articulate way. That means it's true. Ha, 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 ha. No, they're going to try to adjust. Yeah, they'll die. Right? They're, um. they're, but, but how so? Do you think this is because, like, what is... Other than, well, here, here would be a big problem, right? Mm -hmm. Taiwan. Like, if, if we impose the kind of sanctions that we've imposed on Russia, 
if, if China decides to invade Taiwan and the world stands up and the world imposes sanctions on China, how does that? Ha ha ha. That's funny that ape man Joe Rogan thinks that's how sanctions work. <laughs> the world stands up and imposes sanctions, even though the whole world is trying to stand against like uh, the sanctions on Venezuela and the UN has called for the US to alleviate them many times. However, the IMF, the World Bank, and their thousands of subsidiary banks um, are all controlled by Western finance capital. They've all been set up um, by the West. So the U.S. has unprecedented control over the global financial system, which is something that China has been combating with the Belt and Road Initiative, which is why more and more countries are turning towards trade with Russia and China, which is why the effectiveness of U.S. sanctions has gone down. Um but it's not sanctions aren't enforced by the world standing up against evil dictators. They're enforced when the West wants regime change, when the West wants to surround a country and prevent any trade from getting in or out to starve that country's people and turn them against their government. Go. Uh, very ugly for the Chinese. So, you know, say what you will about the Russian economy. It's corrupt. It's inefficient. It's not very high value add, but it's a massive producer and exporter of food and energy. You put the sanctions that are on the Russians on Beijing and you get it. It's funny when they actually say something that's true. <laughs> the Russian economy is evil. It's bad. It's a morally wrong economy. Uh, I don't know how you can make that judgment, but Peter Zihan has. Uh, however, they are producing a lot of energy and we need to be worried about that. Deindustrialization collapse and a famine that kills 500 million people in under a year. And the Chinese know this. They can only push so hard. Uh, also, you know, you can make the argument that if the Russians succeed, they actually solve or at least address some of their problems. Even if the Chinese were able to capture Taiwan without firing a shot, it doesn't solve anything for them. They're still food importers. They're still dependent on the United States. They're still energy importers. And even if they take every single one of those semiconductor fab facilities intact, they don't know how to operate them because they can't operate their own. And their own are among the worst in the world, not the best. He's somewhat right in that China can't push too hard against... It, they can't push so hard to the point where Western capital pulls out. But like I've been saying, it's an $18 trillion economy, right? Just because intelligence agency talking heads like Peter Zihan want regime change in China um, uh, doesn't mean that Western firms are going to stop making millions and millions of dollars in profit in China because they're making so much off of the consumers in China and the, the labor in China, which is you know, partly the point of reform and opening up will allow the West to make money here. Um, and then the Western bourgeoisie won't want to destroy us, um, or at least portions of it won't. And you see that playing out here. Peter Zihan is trying to encourage all these these corporations to pull their investments from China because, oh, they're going to collapse. They're going to collapse. Trust me this time. Um, and Western Western companies aren't doing it. They're making too much money. And what are they going to do? Like they, they pull out and they're going to put these massive skyscrapers on a plane and like take it out of the like the infrastructure is already there. The conditions are so different from what they were in 78, from what required reform and opening up in the first place. And they're even different from the conditions that that shaped various changes in Soviet policy. We are entering a multipolar world order, the whole world, with the exception of the 14 percent of the global population that's in the global north that belong to the former colonial and to the present imperialist powers, the whole world is saying, F this. I don't want to engage in a world where my policy, internal policy, is dictated by X, Y, or Z country uh, to make my people poor uh, for the sake of sustaining uh, the, the American imperialist order. I'm going to trade with China. And the whole world is turning uh, towards that area. So like the difficulties which pushed communist countries to see the necessity of opening up are becoming less and less and less and less to the point where I, I don't see why not in the foreseeable future an option might be taking up that let's just nationalize all of this shit. And uh, we already have an alternative world that we can continue trading with that's abandoning uh, the imperialist uh, camp. Let's do it. And, and it's the vast majority of the world this time, not unlike uh, it was during the Soviet Union, that it was still uh, a, a, a minority in terms of uh, the whole globe. So, um, you know, he's, he's talking as if even if capital pulls, yeah, if they pull tomorrow, there might be issues. But 
the way that China is developing, I mean, uh, there's no there's no stopping uh, their continual growth. For sure. Unparalleled Dev says Peter Zihan is secretly three multinational corporations standing on each other, occupying an empty suit. I mean, yeah, that's who that's who funds it. Millions of dollars in investment from various companies. Work closely with Lockheed Martin, Goldman Sachs, um, American Bank. So make sure to send some super chats to Midwestern Marks to combat the twelve million dollars that Peter Zihan was given by one corporation in two thousand eleven. <laughs> Um, by giving us two to five dollars or whatever. <laughs> uh, we'll go a little bit longer with this video. We don't have to watch the whole thing. This man is insufferable. Now, the, the only reason, in my opinion, to be <laughs> there's Joe Rogan's pushback. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ah, ah. Be concerned about a Taiwan war is because she is so isolated himself. That when one person is making all the decisions and that one person refuses to access information to make the decisions, strange stuff happens. And when you say refuses to access, what do you mean by that? He it's very concrete analysis there, Peter. Strange stuff happens. And there you have it again. Xi Jinping's the dictator. There's a cult of personality. All the Chinese people buy into nationalism and, you know, a country led by Xi Jinping. But also he's isolated and everybody hates him and he can't get any information because everyone hates him so much. And there's a... There's a good point that uh, Roland Bohr makes in, in one of his articles uh, titled Not Some Otherism. He repeats it in his book, Socialism with Chinese Characteristics, A Guide for Foreigners, which is that a lot of these comments are just based on racist orientalist assumptions about China. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Everyone in the Orient just believes what the leader believes, what the bad dictator, bad oriental dictator believes. And it's just complete bullshit. It's just racism i mean there's a million members and a hundred million members in the chinese communist parties not all of them think the same they come from different class backgrounds um you know there's there's constant like contradictions that they have to address which are not necessary not not negative but it's just a a facet of everyday social life certain contradictions that have to be addressed and um you know to sit there and act like it's just Xi Jinping calling the shots for a country with 1.2 uh, or 3 uh, billion people. It's just completely absurd. It's grounded on these racist assumptions about uh, about China and Chinese people. Yeah, I remember my brother told me once he had a cultural communications class. and They were talking about how the Chinese have a much more authoritarian culture. Um, whatever that means. And it's just I'm like, yeah, I got to be careful with that. He's like, why? I'm like. Sounds like it's just a racist trope. I mean, you know, you could say America has an authoritarian culture. Um, the way we've followed the leader into these disastrous, murderous wars or the way that our economy is structured with, you know, Wall Street shareholders and bankers at the top. You know, you could say that's a far more authoritarian culture than anything China has. But um, it's just tropes. And that's also what this guy, um, Jeff Towson, says in his uh, podcast about in response to Zihan, um, his Joe Rogan appearance, um, is that a lot of these are just tropes from the 90s um, or, or just straight up racist tropes about Chinese people um, being unskilled and just being um, so stupid that they just follow their dictator wherever. Um, when in reality, they're very smart, they're strategic, and they know exactly what they're doing, which is angering the crap out of the West which is why you're getting so much cope and projection from Mr. Zihan here. He does not have normal information flows anymore. Like even at the height of the Trump administration, when Trump was basically isolated himself from the entire intelligence community, uh, he was still getting the daily briefing. There was still information being put in front of him, but Xi is so isolated himself. He doesn't want to hear anything except for what he wants to hear. And since no one knows what the status of the conversation with the voices in his head in on any given day, no one wants to bring him anything unless they're ordered to. How do we know this about him? because there's no one to listen to anymore. That's one of the fun things about Russia versus China right now is that the, the Russian information security is so poor that American intelligence is literally listening in on everything. But in China, we can hear into the office, but there are no conversations happening. So we know that Xi's not getting information because they prevented American intelligence from spying on them. <laughs> what the hell is the correlation there? What does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Oh my God. <laughs> These people are just so, so incredibly insufferable. And he mentioned earlier, like isolation, like 
I'm sure he means she from everyone else, but to, to even use the word isolation in reference to China is absurd. The whole world wants to trade with China. China is basically trading with the whole world. It's helping through win-win international relations. It's helping to create what um, it's hoping to create, which is a you know a common uh, prosperity for an, a shared future for mankind. And um, you know to conjoin isolation in any way next to the country that is establishing the most relations with countries around the world that's developing the whole world uh, uh, through these win-win relations. It's just absolutely absurd. If anything, it's the U.S. who's isolating itself, who, you know, even uh, Europe, who's been, a, a, you know, one of these, uh, um, uh, an aid to empire always to American-dominated imperialism, it's the people at least are beginning to turn their backs on on this order. And it's not unforeseeable that the the U.S.'s greatest allies will soon turn on them because uh, they're on their alliance and their following with the U.S. is making their people's lives a lot worse to the point of you have these convulsions in France, for instance, where it's not um, it's not unseeable that in, in in any moment you know the revolutionary situations could could arise and something a more profound change could happen in these countries. So um, Europe is going to have to ask itself: Does it want to continue following? Uh, the U.S. or is it going to prioritize its sort of national uh, uh, security and the capitalism that exists there? For sure. And I won't torture you guys too much more with uh, Peter Zihan, but I did want to show people the comments because I I braced myself. You know, I cringed when I went into these comments thinking that it was going to be a bunch of people falling for what Peter Zihan said, like Carlos said earlier, you know, it's it's hard for uneducated people to, to see through this stuff, but people must be seeing through this stuff or at least their instincts, the Joe Rogan audience, their instincts were to be questionable of this guy. So look at all these uh, top comments, at least on YouTube, obviously um, Rogan's on Spotify, but um, the top one here, the only thing I know for certain is that Joe should have this guy back on in a decade and play back the entire interview to see how it compares to what's actually happening in China. Agree. And I think they should have Carlos and I on as well, um, so that we can compare our predictions about China to, um, those of Peter Zihan. Um, analyst, one of the only jobs that doesn't get you in trouble when you're wrong. So this guy calling out Peter Zihan's previous wrong predictions that didn't come true that he's never had to apologize for. He's never even had to walk back. You know, Joe Rogan doesn't even say, what about that 2010 Business Insider article you wrote that said China was going to collapse within the next decade? It's a decade later, and you're making the same claim, dog. Um, Peter published an article, this comment, Peter published an article in 2010 saying China would collapse in the next decade. Fast forward to now, China is still here. Peter basically keeps predicting every decade until either it happens or he dies of old age still predicting next comment um i'm sure and making, might... and making a ton of money predicting every decade that in the next decade uh china is gonna fall yep exactly um lars michael says i'm sure this guy knows a lot and has some good points but he expresses everything with 100 percent certainty and i've never met a competent person that does that True, but that is how all the neocons operate, isn't it? These intelligence people, folks like John Bolton, it's everything is black and white. These are the bad guys. We're the good guys. Here's what's going down. I can predict the future. Um, just listen to me. It's it's what an ideological um, demagogue does, I guess. Um, it's not what somebody who's trying to make a measured and accurate analysis does. And So this is someone who knows nothing about China. Right. But just from Zihan's arrogance, they can tell that he's not a serious intellectual who's doing serious work here. He's this guy. He's either the greatest bullshitter to ever live or is truly confident in his information. Um, yeah. It's definitely the former. Um, <laughs> but I wonder what role it's uh, what role the fact that uh, the American people just don't trust the establishment class what role has that played in them recognizing how it is that a lot of these people who are super confident about what they say and they make these pompous statements about socialism and you know whatever form of life exists outside of the uh, western imperialist status quo i wonder what role that's played in them sort of generalizing that analysis and just recognizing oh when someone's 
is speaking to me in this way, in the same way that the Pete Buttigieg's and the Hillary Clinton's and uh, the Obamas do, they're probably telling us some bullshit. Or in the same way that other, you know, mainstream Republican candidates do, they're probably feeding us a load of bullshit uh, through a very um, confident and, and uh, rhetorically elegant uh, form. Absolutely. Um, I was going to say something else, but I can't remember. Um, I was going to react to this video originally before I just figured we react to the Rogan video, but this is the kind of uh, content that Zihan now puts out regularly. This is just him in his backyard, shows a snapshot, a, a piece of data in isolation, and then says, you know, this proves that this proves the incoming collapse of China, which is exactly what Carlos said. Um, he's not making a dialectical analysis. He's not assuming that China can adjust their policy based on changing demographics. It's just, here's a snapshot of this data and here's how it proves my conclusion, which of course he's working backwards from his conclusion that China's gonna collapse. That's what he's been doing for the last 20 years. But look how many views this has, 577,000 views for someone with only 490,000 subscribers. That is very sketchy. You know, how often do you see that happen? Um, someone get way more views than they have subscribers on a video this simple, you know, a video without One even thing. any editing. Um, and, and all of his videos are like that. Look at the incredible view counts that this boring ass dude gets making these predictions that never seem to come true. So um, not I mean, there's no hard evidence, but I'm just so skeptical nowadays of account this one 786,000 views i'm so skeptical of these accounts being boosted by bots um or even just being boosted by the um the algorithm which is of course of course controlled by western corporations even in the case of tiktok which is a, a company based in um, china um, or, or owned by a chinese company bite dance um so yeah, yeah, very interesting. This guy clearly got a lot of powerful people um, supporting him, spewing his sky is falling, China's collapsing nonsense. Oh, uh, I want to take a second to acknowledge our super chat. So we didn't even acknowledge this one from Ross. He had to head out, but thank you so much, Ross, um, for the five euros. Use your head, 414. Keep doing God's work, brothers. Thank you. Uh, we will. Your super chats make it possible. That's Spinoza's God, by the way. Yeah. Uh, the, the God we, we could believe in somewhat as materialist. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, believe in whatever you want. <laughs> and and uh, thank you so much for the $10 super sticker. Big spender. Doesn't even have a question or a comment. Just wanted to support the show. So thank you very much, NF. Thank you to all the YouTube members as well. I appreciate the crap out of all of you. Uh -huh. So next, should we jump into, what do you want to do? Tucker Carlson on the, the Capitol riots or Lacerdo? Um, I think thematically Lacerdo would uh, perhaps be a little bit more relevant. I agree. It makes sense. Um, so... I posted this on Twitter for people to read it if they wanted before this stream. I don't know if anyone did, but um, this is Domenico Lacerdo, who everyone should read and reread and study. Um, fantastic Italian Marxist-Leninist thinker. And this is his, um, what ends up being a defense of China, but it's um, just an essay on his China turn to capitalism. Um, and what he does is assess China's reform and opening up policy. Um, compares it to uh, the NEP in the USSR, um, talks about the vast reduction of what he calls global. Well, he, he breaks it down into two different kinds of inequality. You have inequality within the, the masses and or I mean, within the people or inequality within China between the working masses and um, the capitalists. Um, but then you also have global inequality. Um, so what's been most important for China in, you know, the reform and opening up period and, uh, the, the period where they're trying to increase their productive forces has been combating this global inequality, bringing up the standard of living, um, for the country as a whole. Um, and then in the, in the last 20 years or so, we've seen them move towards this, um, new goal of common prosperity or what Deng Xiaoping called common prosperity 
where they've cracked down on corruption. They've launched these um, efforts to reduce inequality within China. Um, they've done the poverty alleviation efforts, which has led to the incredible achievement um, that is the the eradication of relative poverty in China. Um, so not only have they greatly increased the productive forces the way that they've aimed to, um, they've also done a lot to rein in um, what Deng Xiaoping called the animal spirits of the market or the animal spirits of capitalism that they knew were going to need to be contained when um, the reform and opening up policy was gone through with. Um, so they make a distinction. I've heard Carlos talk about this plenty of times between the political um, expropriation of power versus economic. So basically, you know, we can have capitalists so long as the state remains in control of the working class or the working class remains in control of the state. And so long as the state keeps tabs on, um, as we said, the animal spirits of, of capital. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's probably the best defense of socialist China. Um, that I've seen in this succinct form. Obviously, there are longer books expounding on this idea, but it's incredible to read. It's only like 16, 17 pages. And I recommend everybody check it out. Yeah, I uh, I quote it quite a bit in my book on the purity fetish. I have a whole chapter um, addressing how the purity fetish relates itself to Western Marxist analysis of China. And this essay, and also the one that Roland Bower does, that's called Not Some Otherism, where he goes like point by point uh, through various categorizations of Western Marxists on, on China, state capitalists, authoritarian capitalists, uh, state communist, capitalist socialism, et cetera. And he debunks all of them. Um, so he does a, a similar uh, thing to what Roland Bauer does here, just take the assumptions on China and just completely destroy them. But that distinction between international inequalities and national inequalities is so important and uh, it's a form of class struggle. And this is something that you get quite explicitly in other of the sort of texts you have, for instance, in his class struggles, uh, perhaps the best formulation of what the Marxist understanding of class and class, the theory of class struggle is. And of course, you have in the manifesto, the famous line, the history of all at earth or existing societies is the history of class struggles. It's plural. It's not just one specific form of struggle. And um, what this ends up implying is that class struggle ends up being a universal and like all universals within uh, the dialectical tradition, we don't think that these universals are separate from the particular where you have the universal here and the particular here. If we're talking about class struggle as a universal, that means it always has to take a specific form. Sometimes it takes the form of the proletariat directly fighting back and, and the shop floor. Sometimes it takes the form of peasant revolt. It takes different forms and the U.S. has taken... Uh, specifically the form of, uh, uh, many times, specifically the form of the struggle against racism and against racist false consciousness. Uh, the first form, Engel says, that it took is the struggle against uh, patriarchy and, and the struggle against uh, sexism. Um, and it takes a, a wide variety of forms. And it's in national liberation struggles, the form that that class struggle takes is the form of national liberation. And so this is fundamentally an important distinction from the people that talk about all these struggles as different forms of struggles that are not class struggles. And so when you have this framework of like a national liberation struggle is a form of class struggle. And when you look at capitalism, not just as like a national affair, but as an international global phenomenon, when China is bridging the global uh, inequality gap, what it's doing is advancing the international class struggle. It's as a nation, it's advancing its class interest and pushing back against the power of the imperialists. So it's an, it's an incredible advancement for socialism. And of course, it did that first, and it, it's bridged that inequality before getting to the national forms of inequalities that it does in the Xi Jinping era with uh, the turn towards common prosperity. But uh, Lusuro, as always, he ends up highlighting very nicely things that are implicit in Marx's analysis, but he takes them to their logical conclusion and he shows how that's the case. And um, this distinction between political and economic capital, I find it to be so important. And again, it's grounded in Marx. Marx does not have a, um, a, a doctrine where he says, this is what socialism is. If you don't live up to these pure ideas, you're not uh, actually socialist. You're, it's not real socialism as uh, the Western Marxists are fond of saying. That's the form of 
Marxism that I call the purity fetish, the purity fetish Marxism. That's not at all how uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Mao, et cetera, et cetera, think about Marxism and socialism. It's in a completely different form. What they prioritize is the real movement of history, which abolishes the present state of things, real social relations, overturning how it is that things are. And in the manifesto, Marx is very specific about the fact that the proletariat grabs political power, it grabs political power, and then it rests by degree the capital of the capitalist. So it's you take away the capital and you nationalize it in accordance to the role that it can play in developing the forces of production. So uh, if capital is playing a fettering role, then of course you nationalize it and you speed up the, the role that it can play in development. This is what you have in the five-year plans with Stalin and the process of collectivization. This is, I think, what the U.S. is probably going to look like. We've had a lot of, um, we already are a, a, a developed society almost crumbling and uh, and capital is playing a genuine, strong, fettering role to the development of the productive forces. So I think the path of nationalization and uh, a more focused expropriation of economic capital is going to be very important. Um, but in China, that wasn't the case. It came uh, from a semi-colonial, uh, semi-feudal uh, background. Capitalism hadn't fully developed, and so there wasn't the infrastructure to make that transition to, to socialism. And uh, Mao ends up emphasizing in various speeches in the mid-50s the importance of you know, letting capitalism develop the country. And if it's able to develop the productive forces and move us closer to socialism, then capitalists, uh, especially the ones that are anti-imperialist and anti-colonial and anti-feudal, end up being one of the people. They end up being within the revolutionary classes. That's the whole period of new democracy, whose spirit really ends up coming back uh, with uh, the reform and opening, opening up in 78. And that had started before the founding of the PRC in 49, because you had these liberated, liberated areas that had these mixed uh, uh, modes of production where the Communist Party led it. But uh but it sort of cites here, and this is the last point, a very important um, um, lecture that Mao does where he makes this distinction between political, political capital and economic capital. And he says that what we can never give the bourgeoisie even a little inch of is political capital. We have to hold political supremacy. The proletariat, the Communist Party needs to hold political supremacy. That's what the dictatorship of the proletariat entails. Uh, economic supremacy and economic capital you know, it depends on what role the bourgeoisie can play in developing it. And that's very important. And that's in line with the spirit of Lenin, who said that in socialist society, the emphasis ends up turning uh, in as a defining characteristic of society from economics to politics. What ends up being most important is politics, because politics, for the first time ever in history, is self-conscious of the role of economics and politics and et cetera. Sorry, that was a kind of a rant, but... No, that's all right. Um... Sebastian, thank you for the super chat. He says he's on the train, but he can't wait to watch this back. And that reminds me of the train analogy that Lacerdo uses in this essay where he talks about, um, imagine two trains leaving the station. The one is the inequality that exists within China, and the other is the inequality that exists between China and the rest of the world or the developed world. Um, and clearly, you know, China is increasing their overall wealth. The one train um, is speeding ahead and China's catching up with the world to the point where they're now leading the world, the second largest economy. Um, and some people have argued that the, the inequality within China, because of that, has run away. Um, it's uh, there's no way to reel it in. Um, but this is untrue, as we've seen by the efforts of Xi Jinping to combat inequality, combat corruption, um, which is also a way to maintain um, political control, control of political power by the proletariat and wrest it from um, the bourgeoisie. Uh, but also part of the reason that there was inequality is because there are so many different regions in China. And as Carlos said, some of them had mixed modes of production. Some of them are close to the sea where they have a lot of ports and a lot of access to commerce. Some of them are landlocked. Some of them are rural. Some of them are in mountainous regions. Um, so a lot of the inequality that existed wasn't even between capitalists and workers. It was between different regions in China. And what they've done through the poverty alleviation efforts is, you know, massively reduce inequality and massively increase standard of living in the rural regions, bringing health care and Wi-Fi and uh, water and, and shelter to the rural regions. And another big part of that has been uh, giving the the 
rural Chinese citizens plots of land where they can grow their own means of subsistence and where they're given supplies and tools by the government to grow their own means of subsistence. So, you know, ultimately the idea that that growing inequality during what's called the wild 90s or right after the reform and opening up period, you know, symbolize or means that China's not socialist anymore is pretty absurd, especially if you look at the last 10, 20 years and what China has done to combat um, the animal spirits of capitalism. I keep falling back to that analogy because it, it's such a good one. Um, you also have the analogy Xi Jinping uses in the governance of China, where he talks about the visible hand versus the invisible hand. Right? The in, we know that the invisible hand's a thing. We know that the market uh, does its thing and private capital does its thing. But we have the visible hand. We have the state um, and the state-run industries um, that are controlled uh, by the party and by the people. And even you know the the private capital, the private corporations that do exist in China um, are still under the direction of the state and aren't allowed to um, go against the, the plans of the state. I also want to just say thank you to Kyle Parker for the $2 super chat. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, as I said, necessary to do what we do on the show. And we would love to have D Diego Rusarin on the stream sometime. We will definitely reach out to him about doing that soon. I think this is a good question um, uh, from Japanesis. Uh, he says, interesting thoughts on China equals state capitalism. David Harvey has said once you open your doors to capitalism, it cannot be tamed, if I understand them correctly. Uh, and Professor Wolf says that the U.S. and the USSR both vacillate from state and private capitalism. And in all, they uh, seem to think that the USSR wasn't uh, then and China isn't now socialist. Someone correct me, but I've missed it either Harvey or Wolf. No, you haven't misunderstood them. That's, um, that is what they say. And it's wrong. <laughs> um, uh, the Roland Bohr, not some otherism article, uh, he addresses the uh, claims by David Harvey that China state capitalists, um, and Wolf's claims are of a somewhat uh, similar character. Well, both of these people end up forgetting. Uh, and it's a point that, that uh, uh, Lenin makes. In, uh, in criticizing Kautsky and how it was that he supported the First World War, and I reference this in, in my book on the purity fetish, Kautsky said, well, the First World War is not a purely imperialist war. You have in certain sections of the people involved national liberation struggles, and because it's not purely imperialist, we can support it. Um, and what ends up happening is that uh, because these places are not purely socialism, uh, or what they consider to be socialism. In the case of uh, Dick Wolf, it's um, worker cooperatives and you know full democratization of the workplace. In the case of um, Harvey, something somewhat similar. They're both working together in democracy at work, Wolf's project. Uh, since it's not purely socialist, then it could be rejected. Um, and what it misses is the fact that there's no such thing as a pure mode of production or a pure mode of life. Right. The feudal mode of life contained different forms of property relations and forms of production. You had like merchant capitalists in the feudal mode of production. But that doesn't mean that because there was merchant capital uh, that there was capitalism in the capitalist mode of production. You sustain certain feudal modes of property. That doesn't mean that it's feudalism in the capitalist mode of production. You have, you know, like a, a store that's like a few minutes from my house, a cooperative neighborhood store which is a form of socialistic arrangement, that doesn't mean that it's socialism. R uh, Richard Wolff wouldn't say that, okay, if we get like 100 new cooperatives in the US, now we have socialism, right? Because these modes of production, you have to look at which one is the dominant one, the one through which all the other ones are mediated, which is the dominant form of production. Under capitalism, it's capitalist commodity production. It's guided by the market. Under Chinese socialism, under Soviet socialism, et cetera, et cetera, it wasn't. It was different forms of, of socialist, state-owned, people-owned, people-controlled, commanded, planned uh, property. And then the market is mediated by that, and private property and the development of capitalist property is mediated by that, and it's made to serve the ends of the main dominant economic mode, which is the socialist mode. And there's very specific details uh, that show how it is that they do that, for instance, in corporations, there's a percentage of members of the Communist Party that you need in certain corporations in order for those corporations to run. And that's done for the sake of uh, assuring uh, for the Communist 
uh, party members within the corporation, assuring that there aren't practices that end up super exploiting the working class and that if the company grows, the growth is reflected also in the common prosperity uh, in the working class. And so uh, just measures like that, the, the state intervention in the market to ensure that it's working for the sake of people and not just in a very predatory fashion for the sake of capital. Like it functions completely different. So yeah, there is capitalist private property and yes, there are markets, but they don't function anywhere near to how they function in the Western capitalist imperialist states because the dominant mode of production and the state uh, power is in the hands of the people. It's a socialist mode of production that mediates everything else. For sure. Great, great explanation. I think another interesting focus of Lacerdo's piece is the criticism of populism um, or sort of this religious obsession with like the righteous poor or with the idea that because China's not in poverty anymore, they're no longer socialist. They're no longer pure, which is something that that the Western left has um, has plagued the Western left for a long time. Um, and sort of this obsession um, with poverty, right? And this uh, idealizing um, poverty versus Marxism sees capitalism as a fetter on the productive forces, right? Capitalism prevents the productive forces from developing at a certain point, causing the relations of production to burst asunder. Um, so China in advancing their productive forces and in becoming powerful has caused a lot of leftists to condemn it, you know, for say, uh, people getting rich, you know, look at all the millionaires, there's millionaires and billionaires in China. Um, you know, forgetting, uh, the train analogy that we just gave with China's need to, to, um, uh, decrease global inequality and all the efforts they've made to, to decrease inequality within their own country. Um, and then, you know, also the claims of China just being an imperialist power, you know, they're rich, there's finance in China. Okay, that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're imperialist. Who's the finance controlled by? Well, all the banks are owned by the state, you know, who controls the state, the party and the working class, the politics are controlled by the working masses. So um, that's why China's Belt and Road Initiative and, and China's global loans to other countries are focused on developing industry in those countries, developing equity, mm -hmm. uh, meaning um, building things that make more money as time passes, you know, building productive infrastructure that's going to help make these countries rich so they can be a trading partner with China for a long time. That's why China's canceling debt. That's why the interest rate on these loans are set at around 4% which was the same interest rate that the U.S. gave to their allies in West Europe during the Marshall Plan so that they could build them up, create a buffer between them and communism and, and have trading partners for the next 70 years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's there's this obsession or this hatred of, of wealth, you know, on this sort of puritanical religious uh, hatred of wealth on the Western left that causes them to condemn China that uh, Lacerdo critiques really well in this. And that what that ends up showing, and I make a, I make this argument in the book on the purity fetish, is that their socialism is grounded in ressentiment, um, and simply a transvaluation of the values that dominate capitalist society. They're not able to see that well. Wealth has to be completely rethought of. Instead of thinking about wealth from the standpoint of capital accumulation, we have to do it from the standpoint of meeting people's needs and allowing people to flourish and growth. We need to rethink uh, growth, not abandon it. Uh, they just completely invert that. It's a transvaluation of values, and they end up just uh, with an ethic that prioritizes and that considers virtuous to be poor. Um, and they end, up, they end up feeding into, you know, what Nietzsche uh, would call slave morality. Um, and this is a mistake. This is a, a, a very, very big mistake. Socialism is not about poverty. Marx's argument is not that the capitalism develops uh, tremendously, but really we are supposed to be nice and poor and live in, in, in our poor communes. That's not, that's the opposite of what it is. Capitalism is bound to fail. One of the reasons of which is the fact that its relations of production present a fetter, present an obstacle to the development of the forces of production. We could do things better, more efficiently and do more of it without the capitalist relations of production. It's the essence of the argument. And that rejection that you have, um, and you see it specifically after reform and opening up, where you have these poverty uh, socialists that they are uh, very dogmatic and then uh, they end up becoming the Maoists. Uh, no offense to the Maoists out there, but uh, in general terms, what the Maoists are. 
um, they reject China because of that, because China developed and didn't want to sustain uh, in its pure form of production the, the sort of poverty that existed within its people and the global inequality that it was subjected to. The same reactions that these people made to reform and opening it up were made by some of the Catholic Christian socialists uh, who had this brand of poverty socialism that they were attached to when the Soviet Union, after the difficulties that were caused by war communism, uh, where the Soviet Union was invaded, I think by 14 countries, the, the major European imperialist powers and some other ones, um, it was invaded and it had to have this period of, of, of war communism. And then they break out of that period with Lenin's uh, new economic policy, which, yes, opens up a sphere uh, for for capitalists to come in and for technicians to come back so that they could develop the forces of production. And Lenin realizes, hey, you know, some of the comments I made in like state and revolution um, were not so correct because experience has proved that the most important thing is one, protecting the revolution and developing a strong and efficient state and, and means of productions and uh, the defenses and technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes because you end up being blocked from the world, the way to do that is to open yourself up to uh, the capital of, of, of the West. So the same, you know, China, uh, China does something similar to that move uh, in the NEP and the same reactions that a lot of these poverty socialists, a lot of them who were Christian in, in the case of Russia that they had, which is, oh, no, they betrayed socialism, they're bad. Instead of prioritizing this sort of poor, ascetic communism, um, they've turned towards uh, developing the forces of production. The same thing happened with, in 78. And I think uh, Losordo quotes a, a few of the priests who ended up having that reaction to the NEP there in that article. He does, yeah. It's it's pretty interesting, the... Um... You know, that basically the same thing that happened in China with reform and opening up happened in the USSR with the NEP, where a bunch of people come up and say, you know, no, it's not real socialism, um, which is actually a conversation I was having with a friend of mine who's a, a Maoist and um, supports China against imperialism. But, you know, ultimately thinks China is revisionist and not real socialism. Um, I sent them this and, and was making those arguments. So it was an interesting conversation. Helped me understand the Maoist position better, actually. But um, yeah, do you have anything else you want to say about this piece, Carlos? I know I read it the last two days and you haven't read it in a while, but um, obviously you know it sort of inside and out after um, citing it um, so much in your book. But uh, I think we covered all the main um, important points here. Uh but yeah, I recommend everyone read it. Um, you can listen to our breakdown analysis of it and that'll help, but nothing will help you retain the information quite like reading it. Well, I mean, com combine, you know, listening to us with reading it and then you'll retain the information really, really well. Um, so yeah, anything else you got, Carlos? Uh, no, that's it. I think these are uh, uh, short uh, scholarly articles. They're densely packed with great information and um, for those of you who, um, you know, don't have the time to read full books, I definitely recommend um, reading articles like this. You get a lot in uh, relatively in maybe one tenth of the time of reading a whole book. Oftentimes, yeah, books are just like a few of these articles put together. Yeah, right. Lacerdo's got another really good one um, on China where that tree diagram I always use comes from. The tree diagram I try to use to explain the DPRK to Bausch, um, where it says Marxists support national sovereignty, then, you know, economic um, growth and economic sustainability. And then at the top, you have cultural, civil and political rights and um, compare compares that to liberalism, um, which um, I can't remember exactly how the liberalism tree is structured. But either way, lots of good. Um, it's another like 20 page article from Lacerdo that I read on the plane on a plane one time that um, was chock full of knowledge. So um, thank you, Anubis, for the five dollar super chat. Really, really appreciate that. Appreciate all the super chats we're getting today. Um, very, very helpful for what we do at the Institute here. Um, Peter Zihan is a CIA propagandist, pretty much. Um, we, we went through his background there. He worked for um, a consulting firm, a strategic geopolitical strategic um, firm, basically a corporate think tank that works for corporations and has, has had millions and millions of dollars dumped into it by 
um, different corporations and has worked directly with Goldman Sachs, Lockheed Martin, and at one point leaked emails uh, that were leaked by the hacking um, group Anonymous show that Peter Zihan and his organization were getting information directly from the Central Intelligence Agency. So as close to a CIA propagandist as you can get without actually working for the CIA, but we know that's how the CIA likes to do things. They love to work through proxies, right? They love to have NGOs do their dirty work for them. And then when you try and point out the connection, people like Vouch will say, what do you mean? There's no connection there. You know, these NGOs did that, not the CIA. When, of course, the NGOs are just doing the bidding of the CIA. Where can I find these kinds of articles online? I mean, JSTOR is one place. Like, you can use search engines like Google Scholar that give you peer-reviewed academic articles, which is better. You know, there's still issues with a lot of the stuff that gets published and which the stuff that they don't allow to be published. Um, but it's still going to be much, 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 much better. Um than what you get from non-scholarly sources like Wikipedia at this point might as well be written by the CIA. Um, it's kind of absurd with how bad it's gotten. So you scholarly sources, um, but do you have any other recommendations besides that, Carlos, for finding stuff like this? Uh, the main difficulty is usually that stuff is behind paywalls. And uh, even if, if, unless you're like in one of the top notch universities, your school, is likely not going to have access to a lot of uh, databases where these articles are indexed. Um, so you could work around that through like interlibrary loan, and it takes a couple of days for like the article to get to you. Um, otherwise, uh, what I usually end up doing if I need an article now um, is just looking up the name of the article in PDF on Google. And Google seems to be the best search engine for if there are PDFs that have been uploaded, uploaded uh, for finding them. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very tough and it sucks that so much knowledge is put behind paywalls or even the people that don't have to go through paywalls like myself that I can just ask my library to send me an article. It's like, sometimes I want to read it now and I want to see if it's even relevant and not have to go through the process of asking for it, waiting three days. And then it's like, uh, you know, sometimes it, you know, it works and, but, uh, you know, sometimes you just want to read it right then and there and see how you can plug it into the ideas that you're developing on, on paper when you're writing. For sure. For sure. That's good advice. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about, I know, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but Joe Biden, this will be a short segment, but Biden tweeted on my watch, healthcare is a right, not a privilege in this country, which is insane okay so he tweeted this when the united states <clears throat> is the only wealthy industrialized country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to its citizens pretty basic tweet by me we all know this right so it's ridiculous for biden to be patting himself on the back to be bragging about how he protects health care as a right not a privilege when we're the only wealthy industrialized nation without health care i mean it's just completely absurd it's laughable i wonder why his handlers even let him go ahead and tweet this but especially after he just approved cluster bombs to ukraine right which are supposed to be a war crime because of the way that they kill civilians and destroy infrastructure um and you know leave toxic waste all over the place you're not supposed to use cluster bombs but we're sending them to the desperate um backed into a corner um uh government of ukraine um puppet government of ukraine that we're trying to um, that we've been pushing into this proxy war with Russia. So as this guy is using your tax dollars on cluster bombs to kill kill children and keep pushing um, Ukrainians to their death and you know continue to kill Russians, um, he's bragging about the healthcare system. And hilariously, the Twitter actually fact checked Joe Biden. And said, Joe Biden has never publicly supported universal health care or Medicare for all and has suggested that he would veto bills that implement such a system. His stated policy goal is affordable health care by expanding existing programs like the ACA and Medicare. So Twitter destroys Joe Biden with a fact check here. <laughs> Shows that not only is he against or not in favor of Medicare for all or universal health care, but he said he would veto it. He said he would block it. So this arrogant dickbag that's running our country, this 
arrogant bastard is sending cluster bombs to kill civilians in East Europe um, as Americans are dying every day because they don't have access to health care. And he's just bragging on Twitter about how awesome our health care system is. When if anyone tries to fix our health care system, he said he'll veto it. So or if Congress tries to fix our health care system, he said that he'll veto it. So absolute scum. The fact that anyone thinks this guy is better than Republicans or better than anyone is insane to me. He's the same as a neocon like John Bolton. He's got the same ideology at this point. Um, a disgusting man running a disgusting empire. It's perhaps even worse because at least they're honest. The Republicans are honest about being, as you just eloquently stated, uh, dickbags. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're lying to you. They're, I mean, the fact that he's saying this, it's uh, a Medicare for all single payer system or, or, or policy would, is tremendously uh, favorable amongst the population. Like 80 something percent amongst Democrats high 60s, low 70s amongst Republicans and around the same numbers for independents. Uh, so he has to make it seem like he's that guy, like the guy that's in favor of, uh, you know, um, the U.S. is it's it, it's so hard to make sense of why the hell he would say this. And my inclination is that it's such a popular policy um, or, or, or rhetoric like healthcare as a human right that he wants to kind of attach himself to it, especially with the next with the election coming up next year. But he just can't. Like people are very informed about this, and now you have, uh, you know, the Bernie movement changed the consciousness of people in this area. And um, you know, RFK doesn't go far enough. He doesn't want Medicare for all, but at least he's critical of the tremendous role that the medical pharmas pharmaceutical industrial complex has in funding politics and media, et cetera, et cetera, and shaping the narrative that exists about the uh, industrial complex itself. And um, so I don't, I don't see the, the American people buying into this or falling for this. And it's, you know, a tremendously uh, based moments as the kids would say uh, that uh, Twitter would, would go ahead and, and fact check and, and show how he's uh, fully wrong uh, in, in what he's saying and lying, just frankly lying. Right. There are millions of Americans who don't have health care coverage right now. Uh, you know, I'm one of them. I don't have health care. So how am I supposed to, and Carlos, too, so how are we supposed to interpret this tweet? It's a right, not a privilege. Well, apparently not, because I don't have it. Right. So that's, I mean, he wants to attach himself to this policy, but there's millions of people who are like, the hell are you talking about? It's a right. Yeah. I'm literally a citizen living in your country and I don't have health care. How are you going to tell me it's a right? Um, so just not, I mean, nonsensical. Um, and we have, we have so many takedowns of this that it's hard to just keep going, but I would definitely point people to Eddie's article from the second issue of the journal of American socialist studies, where he breaks down the, um, the sort of political economy of the influence of medical pharmaceutical of the medical pharmaceutical industrial complex. He talks about the opioids epidemic, how it was constructed by them and, um, I have a paper coming out in Cuba where I piggyback on that and develop it um, in some other ways and connect it to some other issues. And I, uh, we will be publishing the English version of that paper in the third issue of the Journal of American Social Studies later this year. But um, yeah, we've we've done a lot of work in this area, and I think it's important. It's usually one of the main areas that ends up radicalizing people, um, and it's such a uniquely American capitalist imperialist. Um, issue you know it's the only developed country in the world that doesn't have some form of socialized uh, medicine guaranteed for for its people and it just tells you how stupid the capitalist class is <laughs> and at least you'd be like okay let's at least make sure that when they get sick they can get treated so that they can come back to work and continue being exploited but not even that uh not even that um and this is the guy that now the progressives who once popularized uh, Medicare for all are all like backing, you know, a, a whole a year and some change uh, before the election. AOC just came out, you know, literally, I think around the same time as the cluster bombs were announced. She came out in a podcast saying that uh, he's done a terrific job. Uh, and yeah, he's not perfect, but I support him for 2024. This is the champion of the progressive uh, justice Democrat uh, left. They're, the capitalist class, like you said, is stupid. They're greedy. They can't stop profiting off the healthcare system because they're used to it now. And 
the American healthcare conglomerates have grown to the level where they're one of the most powerful parts of the capitalist class in the country. Um, America doesn't produce that much anymore. We don't manufacture that much anymore, but we do sell a lot of pharmaceuticals and there are very powerful insurance companies and ambulance companies. And they, we sell a lot of healthcare at a, an extremely high price. So um, they've gotten used to making all these profits and the, the healthcare industry has formed an enormous lobby. You know, they, they control vast swaths of the media. Um, they donate to the campaigns of people like Joe Biden, of people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, probably. Um, I know she was only doing small dollar donations um, before. I don't know if she, she stuck to that or not. But either way, they have a huge control of our political system. So even though it would be rational for Joe Biden to say we're nationalizing the insurance industry and moving towards Medicare for all, or we're going to rein in you know um, capital in the healthcare system, he can't because he's a puppet of the capital and the healthcare system. So he continues to act irrationally um, in terms of healthcare, allowing our system to get worse and worse while he brags on Twitter about how amazing our system is. It's, it's almost unbelievable. But um, thank you so much for the super sticker, YHWH, $4 super sticker. And he's a YouTube member. Appreciate that. We also got a, no, um, a new YouTube member earlier. Nam de plume. So that's awesome. If you're a $10 member, I believe you get an ebook copy of Carlos's book, The Purity Fetish and the Crisis of Western Marxism. I'm pulling out all the books today because I just moved and I've got them all just sitting around my desk in stacks. But um, check out, check out that. It's um, absolutely essential reading. I want to say this is a little bit off topic, but um, Kyle Parker says, thank you guys for teaching me the importance of reading. People like Vouch, Destiny, and I would add Andrew Tate openly say they don't read, and it shows. Absolutely. Cannot stress the importance of reading enough. And once, I mean, once you read, especially theory, um, it becomes very easy to see who's a fraud and who's not. Like, Vouch literally claims to have read, you know, Mao, Lenin, Marx, the canon of Marxist theory. Maybe now he's admitted that he doesn't actually read, but. He'll discourage his audience from reading. And that's because he knows if they read, they're going to be able to see through his bullshit. So there's no better way to spot a charlatan than to um, uh, than when somebody's discouraging their audience from reading. And um, Vouch and Destiny are both charlatans. And Andrew Tate takes it to another level. He says, don't read, just take or draw from my personal experiences. Right. And in fact, you he says you can't get smarter from reading books. Books don't teach you anything. You know, just learn from my personal experiences. It's pure arrogance. Anybody who's read knows that's that that's nonsense. Um, but uh, it's so important to read and reading helps you see the philosophical or ideological underpinnings behind, you know, what these people are saying, what folks like Peter Zihan are saying, like, you know, if, not to say that we're amazing or we're super brain geniuses or whatever, but if you want to know how two 26 year olds are able to deconstruct and, and formulate a counter argument to someone like Peter Zihan on the spot, I mean, Carlos was doing it on the spot. I had researched Zihan for a while, but um, it's through reading, right? It's, it's through reading, understanding liberalism as an ideology, um, understanding our own ideology of Marxism um, and being able to deconstruct these things. And that's, you know, People like Vouch and Destiny, they, they'll claim to be socialists or Destiny claims to be a centrist or whatever, but they always end up defaulting to imperialism and to liberalism um, because they don't read. They can't deconstruct the system around them and they just, you know, fall into um, liberal tendencies or, or whatever's easiest or whatever helps them keep an audience. Um, so read, 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 read. That's that there's a reason Lenin stressed studying and reading so much and um, I said this the other day um, in one of our, our Marx or Midwestern Marx University classes that um, one of our buddies, friend of the show, Kyle Pettis, was in Nicaragua. No, sorry. He was uh, in the Dominican Republic. And they were asking about communism in the U.S. You know, communists internationally are always curious about what we're doing here in the U.S., and they said the main thing that we mock about the, the Western left or make fun of when it comes to the Western left is how many parties they make. Right. There's always a new political party coming out and saying we're going to be the vanguard party. Right. 
But what you guys need to do is just get dedicated people, get dedicated comrades and have them study and read Marxism for three years. Right. And then send them into the workplaces, send them to organize communities once they have that tool of Marxist theory to use as a weapon. Um, so um, that for one reason or for one, that's why Midwestern Marx isn't a political party. That's why we're an educational institute that's doing what we do. Um, but two, that shows the importance of reading and, and the importance of theory as a tool and as a weapon for organizing and for um, revolution. And um, I think that's where everybody's focus should be right now um, in these sort of pre-revolutionary years. That's what Lenin was. Everyone talks about. And I got this. I'm stealing this from our buddy Kyle Pettis as well. But he says everyone talks about Lenin in the revolutionary period, but nobody talks about Lenin 10 years before that. Um, the Iskra mm -hmm. period. Nobody talks about the theoretical education that was going on and the studying, um, rigorous studying um, that was being done by the Bolsheviks and even the people who would eventually become the Mensheviks um, in order to um, teach themselves revolutionary theory and, and be more successful organizers. It's kind of like what they, uh, you know, with certain sports analysts, uh, the analogy that they use that, you know, people only see the success, like what goes on in the game. They don't see like all the practice and struggle that's behind that. And it's the same thing. Like people on the left just look at the uh, the weeks where decades happened in the case of Lenin or in Cuba or in China. And they don't look at the decades where supposedly nothing happened. But what ended up happening in those decades was that they were setting up the conditions for the possibility for weeks where decades happened through theoretical training, through preparing cadres, through getting them involved in workplaces, through convincing people and the best parts of the working class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, transforming people's consciousness, working on what's called the subjective factor, the subjective condition. And that's so important. And that's really what we're trying to do through as many means as possible, whether it's our books, our journals, our articles, our, um, our, our live streams, our interviews, our short videos, or now uh, our Marxism school, which you know, we are officially running two schools, Noah's Basics of Marxism and my um, Marxism in the History of Western Philosophy. Uh, pretty soon we'll have one uh, led by Thomas Riggins on anti during what uh, Lenin called the Handbook of Marxism. We'll have one on uh, by, by Danny Shaw as well, Professor Danny Shaw on uh, revolutions and uh, the, the Marxist view of the state and various revolutions from around the world. We'll also have uh, one uh, from Eddie on ideology, media literacy, imperialism, anti-imperialist struggles, etc. Um, so, you know, th this is a, a process of training in each class. We have around 30 people training people um, to develop themselves ideologically. And, you know, once you got maybe a handful, half a dozen uh, of these classes in your belt, you're completely different uh, from who you were before you started. And uh, we want the Institute to grow. We, if it just continues being the, the contributors that we have, the editors and the directors, Eddie, uh, Noah, me, and, and Tom, it's it's not going to get anywhere. We need a, a bunch of people. So uh, as uh, Comrade Eurus uh, Kriya Katoa, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, um, in six years, I'll be ready to join the institution as a fellow researcher. Yeah, uh, we, we want as many people um, as are interested in, in participating and in helping, whether it's editing, design work, writing for us, you know, whatever the case may be, teaching, if you're a professor and you have teaching experience, um, we want the Institute to grow and, and to be a real transformative force in American politics and, and in, the, in the American people's consciousness. And then whatever political organization flows from that, you know, that's history will tell, but we want to focus as the example that you gave from Kyle on that subjective factor for the next uh, few years, at least. Absolutely. I like this. Voosh, more like whoosh, because the point goes right over his head. <laughs> That's my favorite sound effect. <laughs> Pretty funny. Um, yes, I'd like to work with slash for you all at some point soon. That'd be awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, we also encourage people, um, you can work for us or with us or start your own organization like... Um, We've always said the people at RBN, the guys at RBN and, and Savvy, we'd probably invite them to join the Institute if they weren't already doing their own thing. So if you have your own thing, too, we're always willing to work together and um, cooperate. 
Um, yeah, that's that's what we're trying to do with the Institute is raise the level of theoretical education, which we see as being the main task right now for for communists in the West. Um, so I, unless you have well, anything to else me, to I mean, I have that, no... Carlos, we can go to our last segment that we have planned for today. Um, Tucker Carlson dropping some some breaking news or some interesting news about the the chief of Capitol Police. I mean, interest maybe not shocking for people who have been following this and been following the reporting of folks like Max Blumenthal, who I was introduced to through work uh, from Gabriel Rockhill about January 6th. Like Ro Gabriel was predicting this stuff like um, two years ago, maybe now, you know, right when January 6th happened, he was saying, there were FBI infiltrators there. There were state capitol police, you know, all around the area. Um, there were likely people planted by the government to try and rile up the people and, and get them to go inside the capitol. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and now this new revelation from Tucker just kind of confirms what we already knew. But for a lot of people, it's a shocking revelation. A lot of people maybe haven't been following this. They've just been following the mainstream media narrative about January 6th. But in fact, the Democrats have always planned to use January 6th as a way to um, gain political capital um, and to mobilize people to vote Democrat and say, look at what these crazy, crazy, crazy Trumpers did. You better go vote for Joe Biden. Otherwise, we're going to get January 6th all over again and our democracy will crumble um, when, of course, we don't have a democracy. But yeah, anything to say about this before we play the Tucker video? That's all they could offer. Like, uh, the, the only thing the Democrats could offer is the fact that uh, supposedly the Republicans are worse. And even um, even they doubt that. That's why they have to spend millions, tens of millions of dollars funding the most far right obscene candidates in the Republican Party because um, their only platform is... Uh, making the Republicans' platform worse and making them seem more bad so that they can point at that and say, look, they're insane. Vote for us. Exactly. It's all they got. We're not the Republicans. That's enough for AOC, though. And that was a tip-off to me. I mean, I had no thought in my head as I watched this happen on television and in the subsequent weeks that U.S., law enforcement or military agencies had anything to do with it that never crossed my mind i never thought there was it was a false flag or anything like that i'm not a conspiracist by temperament i never thought that um and then i interviewed the chief of the capitol police stephen sund in an interview that was never aired on fox by the way i was fired before it could air um i i'm going to interview him again but stephen sund was the totally non-political worked for Nancy Pelosi. I mean, this was not some right-wing activist. He was the chief of the Capitol Police on January 6th. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That crowd was filled with federal agents. What? Yes. Well, he would know, of course, because he was in charge of security at the site. So the more time has passed, now it's been, and that was a tip-off to me. I mean, I had no thought in my head as I watched this happen on television and in the subsequent weeks that U.S., law enforcement or military agencies had anything to do with it that never crossed my mind i never thought there was it was a false flag or anything like that i'm not a conspiracist by temperament i never thought that um and then i interviewed the chief of sorry it looped there and i didn't even notice but yeah i mean they it's not that they quote unquote staged the whole thing or that trump supporters or QAnon people didn't have anything to do with it but they allowed it to happen um, and they planted, likely planted actors who encouraged it to happen, who riled up the crowd. Much like, you know, Euromaidan in Ukraine started as a real protest, as a legitimate protest. And then, you know, right wing actors kill 67 people and burn a dozen people, uh, trade unionists alive in a building. And they escalated into a violent riot, into a, an eventual coup. And this is how the government acts this is how they do things they prey upon real contradictions they prey upon things that are actually going on real discontent and they try and manipulate it to go their way um and and if you want a full breakdown of this check out um gabriel rockhill's article in counter counterpunch called lessons from january 6 and inside job which this shocked me when i saw it because like tucker said i didn't you know i didn't 
think that that's what January 6th was. I didn't think that the U.S. intelligence or whoever had anything to do with it, but um, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. And the evidence that the U.S. planted psyops within these, or U.S. intelligence planted psyops in these protests um, is, is also maybe not overwhelming, but it's there for sure. Absolutely. And it's not just like, for these sorts of things they do it for all for all sorts of stuff like we when blm was happening uh you know there'd be cases of like random bricks just being left in the corner of the street yep. and then uh people coming up and 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 like those were all set up you know to shape the narrative of the blm protests and i'm sure those people were were agents and there's some reports that have came out and said that they were but um, they're everywhere. Like you'd be stupid to think that they're not playing for all teams, trying to disrupt everything in order to sustain the status quo. There was a TikTok of a a literal TikTok that people filmed from their apartment building of police officers, fully in uniform, setting out a, a just a pile of bricks, like pulling them out of the SWAT vehicle and stacking them up. Like it doesn't get more obvious than that. Um, but our Go ahead. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what Tucker was implying when he said that um, Fox News fired him before it was able to air. But if it was censored by Fox News, then, you know, it shows how both of these sides just play on each other yep. and how each side needs each other. And, I mean, for a communist to play into this false um, dualism, is is absurd it's the same party just like when you when you look at someone's ass it's the same ass just different cheeks different cheeks of the same ass i forget who gave that analogy um, so I'm, I'm sorry that i can't uh, give credit but it's different cheeks of the same ass and that's all it is it is it is that's definitely better than um i don't know two wings of the same bird i'm going to use two cheeks of the same ass forever um uh, but our buddy um, director at the, the Institute, Noah Kratchvik, said um, he made a response to this tweet in response to Tucker, which said, limited hangout narrative that memory holds the entire time leading up to J6, where Trump was enticing the Q tards to act out LMAO. Sure, the feds in the crowd played their part, but they weren't the ones spending months talking about the election fraud or trying to switch vote tallies. So like I said, you know, the, the Trump and QAnon people did play a role, uh, but that doesn't mean that the government didn't prey upon that, that the Capitol Police and the U.S. intelligence agencies and the Democratic Party didn't prey upon that to encourage um, some kind of uprising that could then be used by the Democrats as a political move. Um, so Noah responds and says, to me, this is more confirmation, not of a side being to blame, but the fact that the sides aren't sides at all, that this is all precisely what the ruling class wants to happen. There are a ton of possible reasons for this. Could be the same reason why the Democrats funded neo-Nazis uh, to try to inflate their presence in the U.S. in their media, etc., because this is their only vote for us strategy is they cannot actually implement any policies helpful for the working class. Could be a limited hangout to put attention in one place while something crazy was going down. Um, maybe in Ukraine, don't know. But we need evidence that this is what it is before saying, in my opinion. Limited hangouts are true, though, remember? Um, to me, though, Occam's Razor is saying this is all pretty much hashed out within the ruling class for the ruling class. Their state mm -hmm. is, after all, a committee to settle their affairs at our expense. Mm -hmm. um, side note, let's also remember who was trying to incite violence on January 6th and what the majority of people responded with. Actors, FBI agents within groups like the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, other establishment people like Trump himself, and most people were not down. Exactly. And this is what I was talking about. And this is what Gabriel Rockhill's article details, is that a lot of the people saying, we need to go inside the Capitol, we need to get inside, um, escalating the protest to be more violent were FBI agents, you know, mm -hmm. operating within these far right groups, which people have detailed how every far right group in the country has, you know, some kind of FBI infiltrators in it um, who will then convince them to do something violent, lock them up, and then they get a, like a um, stipend and a promotion from the FBI. Um, so and, and like almost every right wing group that's been um, cracked down on by the, the government in the past however many decades has had an FBI informant um, that's infiltrated it and has been part of it. But um, 
It's all adds up to the bourgeois media spinning this entire thing as an attempted insurrection that has gravity to it. Attempted insurrection, they call it. But there's no such thing as an attempted insurrection where the force being attacked orchestrates and collaborates. <laughs> Based. <laughs> Based no a moment. Yes. Like, uh, did you get to finish watching the, the Tucker video? Because I think that the uh, one that they're reacting to, that one has the... Maybe you can go halfway because I think it looped right around the time where he talked about it. You know. Flag or anything like that. I'm not a conspiracist by temperament. I never thought that. Um, and then I interviewed the chief of the Capitol Police, Stephen Sund, in an interview that was never aired on Fox, by the way. I was fired before it could air. Um, I, I'm going to interview him again. But Stephen Sund was the totally non-political worked for Nancy Pelosi. I mean, this was not some right-wing activist. He was the chief of the Capitol Police on January 6th. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That crowd was filled with federal agents. What? Yes. Well, he would know, of course, because he was in charge of security at the site. So the more time has passed. Now it's been... Is that what you want me to play? Sorry. Had that part played already in the other video? I wasn't sure. Oh, okay. My bad. Yeah, just yeah it just looped, and I didn't notice it, and I let it play halfway through again. You can't really tell where it loops. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, it's it's important to remember that they have their hands in everything. They're not stupid. When you have the, the amount of resources that they have, uh, why not spend those resources infiltrating the enemy or creating fake enemies so that when people want to actually join the enemy of the ruling class, they just end up in one of your controlled pockets of resistance. Um, and we talk about this all the time as, you know, uh, one of the important uh, reasons why we have to attack like the fake left and uh, the pseudo Marxist purity fetish controlled counter hegemonic agents of uh, compatible left. And, you know, but it's, it's, continuous and we can never stop doing it because they'll always discover new forms to, to do it through. And um, these hysterias that are uh, created out of this, we should always be skeptical when there's 24 seven coverage of a thing that's used to legitimize voting for one capitalist, imperialist, fascistic party over another. For sure. For sure. Um, so recommend everyone read that Gabriel Rockhill article. Um, another example of how reading will make you immune to bourgeois propaganda um, helps you get to the truth. Um, and Gabriel cites a lot of really great sources here. So, yeah. Um, well, do you have anything else you wanted to discuss today, Carlos? I think we covered everything in our stream plans, but. Um, no, not much. I, I had a, my, my first class at the Marxism school. Uh, last Wednesday, um, it went extremely well. I'm very excited. The, the, the students are, are awesome. Uh, we ended up adding five new students uh, simply uh, because we moved. We, we added an extra week, and we ended up just doing introductions last week, and we'll start the readings uh, next week. Um, but it's extremely exciting. And um, you know, every I've I've taught for for many years now, and every time I've thought I've taught, it's been within the confines of like, you know, the bourgeois academy, and it's I've been able to get away with things that most teachers wouldn't. But um, now I can you know freely let loose and be clear about the fact that going through the history of philosophy is always going to be done through the point of view of like what rational kernels are sustained for Marxism and what rational kernels are sustained for the bourgeois ideology that we're still fighting today uh, in the heart of the empire. So um, it's very much a history of philosophy, Western philosophy course, but grounded in like, um, why is this important for, for Marxists to understand today? Absolutely. It's going to be really fantastic. I got to be there for the first 45 minutes and meet some of the students. Um, and I plan to I plan to clear my schedule as much as possible and be there for that class. I know I've been in and out of Noah's Marx Basics of Marxism class, you know, maybe every other week or maybe sometimes watching in the YouTube chat. For Carlos's chat, uh, um, not that I there wasn't anything for me to learn from Noah's Basics of Marxism class, but um, I've, I've read a lot of the basics 
uh, basic Marxist text. So uh, with Carlos's class going through the history of philosophy, which is not my field, um, I'm excited because I feel like there's a lot for me to learn and pick up that, that I don't know already. So I'm going to try and basically take that class along with you guys and, and keep up with the readings and stuff. So um, I'll also be in there for discussions or questions or um, interaction. So really looking forward um, to the next class there. And like Carlos said, we've got um, more on the horizon. We got Danny Shaw working on one. I'm working on mine. Um, I also got to finish my Venezuela book. We got a million projects going on, but that's the life of the Midwestern Marx Institute directors. So um, we're happy to do it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I just sent you a song uh, from our most uh, recent contributor, uh, Stephen Joseph Scott, who's an essayist from the University of Edinburgh School of History, but he's also a singer and songwriter uh, and an activist. And, uh, we just published one of his uh, pieces on how it is that the uh, U.S. Uh, conflict with Cuba following the revolution really unfolded. It's a, a very nice piece, um, which we're also going to be adding to Jazz 3. But uh, he has this great song that's uh, got some powerful imagery and that's very critical of empire. And I wanted to play it as the, the closing song for uh, today's stream, which has, of course, as is usually the case, been very critical of American imperialism. For sure. That's that's the perfect way to end it. We'll jump into that. Uh, I just want to say thanks to everyone for being here. Everyone who interacted with the chat. Thank you to our moderators on Parallel Dev, Ware Pilgrim, and Cobra Commander. Appreciate y'all for doing what you do for free. Um, doing a great service to Midwestern Mark. So, all right. Solidarity, everyone. We'll see you next time. It doesn't matter whether or not they were deprived as a youth. It doesn't matter or not whether or not they had no background that enabled them to socialize into the fabric of society. It doesn't matter whether or not they're the victims of society. Victims of society. Victims of society. Are you about to kill this man? Like, look at these big ass guns they got on this man right now. Look at this baby. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal and bring them to heal and bring them to heal and bring them to heal. Shadows don't feel cross, crescent moons out on fire, victims of lies. Angels come to die, families blown to hell, children cry alone. Dogs roam these dark streets, innocence long gone. We know they lie, they know they lie to us again. We know they lie, there's no one love. Disoccupied, divide, pressures beat the drum. From tomorrow to come, packaged in a lie, gangsters all deny. We know they lie, they know they lie to us again. We know they lie, there's no one left.
Resistance in fear. When these states are in gear, resist another lie. Calls for you to die. Loved ones on the ground. With the hills going down, the devil and his guns got you on the run. We know they lie. They know they lie to us again. We know they lie. There's no one love me. We know they lie. They know they lie to us again. We know they lie. There's no one love me. My daddy and did nothing. He's not a criminal. So the government. <laughs> Government, please put your heart. Let my parents be free. And if we're going to get past this, we can't blame it on him. He's a manifestation of the ugliness that's in us. <laughs>